you. Hi. Um, I'm an explorer. I'm always ev interested in everything in arts and sciences. And recently, I got a very interesting idea, which I call maximalism. So I'm going to talk about that, and let me uh, tell you how I explore, explore around the, this idea. I watch TV, but not the TV program. I watch the TV screen from this, this distance. Well, people might think I'm crazy, right? But it's turned out to be very, very interesting and exciting. I can uh, show you how that looks like. So <laughs> when you see the patterns from the very close distance, and it's just pattern is so excessive, so you know, max, max, maximum, right? So I was wondering, you know, uh, because there is no meaning in it, I, I'm so happy with it, right? I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not disturbed by this meaning. But then I was thinking, what happens after this image is coming into my brain, and who is going to interpret what's the meaning in there? Is anyone inside? Is that little, little person is watching these patterns and saying something? Or, uh, <laughs> well, that's a kind of main a question that everybody wants to understand. Then, when the image is coming from the eye, it's just circulating in the brain, right? And circulating and circulating and circulating. That may cause mind, right? Well, I think that's an interesting idea. But we scientists try to minimize the system, right? OK, if this is uh, uh, the mechanism of mind, let's make this kind of system, right? Bring your uh, video camera, plug it into the TV screen, and take the screen on the video. And guess what happens? Well, it goes like this, you know? <laughs> If there's nothing, but it's just pattern is creating and creating forever. It's self-changing patterns. We don't have to program, program anything, but the dynamics itself is changing by itself. So it's so interesting. And then scientists will be happy with it. But where is mind? <laughs> is this brain? You call it brain? Well, that's always the big problem with us some scientists. Right? <laughs> but I found there's two things missing. One is, mindset is not processing in sequentially the images, right? It's always the images coming from uh, old memories to recent memories, or even from the future the brain is predicting. So it's not sequential, it's a bunch of parallel images is back and forth. Second, well, brain is not in the box, right? It always interacting with other brains, other complex in the world. So those two things are always missing when we try to do something, science in the laboratory. So how to make a brain, in, how to understand a mind in a, in a laboratory? Well, I was thinking when I was watching this TV screen, and maybe there is some model that requires real complexity. Right? Don't reduce complexity. Understand complexity as it is. Right? It's opposed to the usual uh, scientist's attitude, but that's what I think is very important to understand the complex system like brain. That's what I call maximalism. Let people to interact with the system, let interact with the real, complex, real world complexity exist. Maybe the brain is much more complex than the universe. Maybe the mathematical structure that is account for this brain system is more complex than the string theory in elementary particles, or wherever you know this thing is. So, based on this maximalism, I try to make a new brain system. Here you go. So, I put big three screens with 15 video cameras. I, I call it mind time machine, because the purpose of this machine is about time. This machine is picking up images from different time frames, different space, and try to mix them together to make a big image. Maybe this system can make a mind. In more detail, I put cameras 
uh, on the poles, and each camera is taking uh, images from the other screen, and the other camera is taking images from that screen, and then projecting onto another screen. So it's an uh, entangled video feedback system that you know, physicists try to use, you know, videos to the, to, to the screen and then connecting. But also, I put a neural network behind the system, which is changing the patterns, taking the, uh, memorizing those patterns, and mix them together, and then projecting onto the screen. So this system has three screens. Top screen is a memory screen. Left screen is a sort of atten an attentional screen that is made out of, uh, of cameras fixed in a space. And um, the other screen is images, which is from the cameras, which can move around. All this control is done by the neural networks. So I show you here how does it look like. So even though there's nothing, it's empty space, and this machine is taking picture from this empty space, but still the system makes such strange patterns. This one is very quiet in the morning. I don't know why, but it's so quiet. And it's not always reacting to the person coming into the MTM. Sometimes it's just neglect. But sometimes, if you like him, then you just you know, interact with him. In the evening, it gets much active. And it's having much more complex patterns. It's highly autonomous. I don't have to program anything. Right? It just self-organizes. It's just making its own structures. So I really like this system. But it's difficult for the scientists to know what's going on here, right? It's too complex. That's what people don't like it, right? <laughs> so the, the best thing I can do with it is to take a diary, right? To make a diary is the best thing I can do with this system. So I put this system in, in the museum for three months. I just run it, go and go, right? And I secretly take the data to my, send it to my, my, my university and to analyze what's going on there. So these red patterns over there is, is a characterization of the internal state of the mind-time machine. And when it's, it's complicated and, and diverse, that means machine is very active. But when it becomes sparse and simple, means that the system is inactive. And so you see, someday it becomes very active, someday it becomes very inactive. So I looked up the weather forecast in that area and see, look, you know, this machine is rather inactive in rainy days. So maybe this machine doesn't like rainy days. <laughs> so what I learned from uh, this mind time machine is you can get something that you cannot get in a laboratory. You have to bring it to the outside. You have to bring to the real world and let people to interact with this system. Then you can have different types of complexity. It reminds me of the book that I read uh, 30 years ago. It was written by Shuji um, <clears> Terajima. <throat> and then he said, uh, throw away your books, go into the street. I really like the book. I also remember around the same age of the year, that the famous artist Nam Jun Paik, he took a robot for the first time to the street. And the robot was hit by the car. <laughs> and he was the first robot who was died in the traffic accident. <laughs> well, that's the maximalism. You have to understand the real world complexity. We know that the, the technology has been get much more power. We have a bunch of power in any technology, but still, we have to bring it to the street, and we have to let them interact with the people and let them interact with the real complexity in the world. That's what I call maximalism. That is a new frontier of science and arts. Thank you very much. Thank you.